There we go. Good afternoon. It's Wednesday. It's day three of NEMS Believe in Music Week, and we are honored to be here, as, as always. It's been a really, really fun week so far, uh, and we hope you guys are enjoying yourselves as well. Um, now, today, we're going to talk about something a little controversial. This is in the banjo world. It's the six-string banjo, whether you call it a banjo guitar or a guitar or git joe or however you want to uh, approach it we call it a six string banjo and it is a legitimate instrument and we are joined today by the wonderful brad davis session legend that he is to kind of talk through the versatility of the instrument and um, hopefully play it in a few few different different tunings different uh, arrangements and, and then talk a little bit about kind of what he does with it hey brad what's going on good to be here guys good to be here and holding my banjo <laughs> Love it. And you, you're, you're in Texas, right? Right. Excellent. Right outside of Dallas, Texas. So uh, it's good to be here. And um, great Very to be cool. involved with Deering and involved with all the, the inventive things that can be done with it, this instrument. Really, really jazzed about it. Well, let's, let's kick it off. If you want to you play a little something for us, and then we'll, sure, we'll get back yeah. into some questions, play, right? Play a new double down up thing I've been working on. Sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. Now I know David's going to take over the questioning just a little bit. I wanted to jump in there because um, the this is you know our audience obviously they love and know banjo and maybe they're intrigued by the six string, but a lot of the the NAM audience maybe are um, kind of new to the banjo. They're not quite as uh, involved in it as, as you are. Now you're you're a session guy, right? Right. Um, and a guitar player. Full time. Uh, I've got three studios here outside of Dallas. I moved my studios from Nashville to here for family reasons. And so we're six days a week. Uh, we have uh, an A, B, and C studio, and I'm basically either playing guitar, bass, mandolin, or this lovely instrument, or singing. Singing know? too, ah, voice of an angel. So my question to you is, you go to, you go to a session, you can take the six string banjo with you and you can you know, take two other guitars. What are you taking with you? Just so people get an idea of kind of where you're at. And, and, and your... you, you know, Jamie, it, it is so varied because we do death metal here, bluegrass, gospel, country, folk. We do such a variety here. Yeah. So uh, my love, obviously playing for Marty Stewart for 11 years, I love telly and uh i love acoustic and i love this instrument mandolin those are my four favorite even though i've been playing upright bass since a young kid but uh this instrument's a lot like playing telecaster so and, and, and in a sense if i had a bender on here or parsons which i know alan mundy had one on his banjo years ago uh i would probably play this more than my telly i don't know but normally in a studio it really depends i mean i'll take a big uh coffin case full of 30 guitars and, and it may be two, my, my Boston in this one, yeah. and then my, uh, my Mando and then like five acoustics and maybe seven or eight electric. So it, it, cause I just need to be ready. I, I gave you a choice of two and you, you bring it ready. That's, <laughs> yeah, I need, I, mean. I need to be ready because if you pay the bills doing this, you really, really have to have enough. Uh, I don't collect, you know, my kids are out of college now, but I don't collect. I just have instruments that I use. And if I don't use them, they get sold. You know, I just don't hang on to them. So, uh, and I think this one's uh, actually become a really mainstay lately, not because of today, but just because of soundtracks lately. You know, two new film soundtracks that I've, I'm under non-disclosure to talk about, but but uh, this has made a an imprint on the soundtracks of both of those films. So I'm excited about that. Very uh, cool. Very cool. Well, uh, I'm going to monitor the the chat rooms. I've got three three chats going on right now, so I'm going to let uh, Young Dave here take over the interrogation and uh, let's talk about some six string banjo thanks everybody yeah. for joining us today so it's kind of got lean off well just from what you said you, you use the the, the um, good time six string banjo on on some uh, soundtracks 
were they looking for a band, you know, a traditional five string banjo sound or was it just a different sound that you used it for? One was looking for uh, a nonlinear banjo sound. That's the way I can describe it. Uh, a banjo sound that sounds um, uh, otherworldly uh -huh. is the only way I can. That's kind of a nonlinear banjo sound, which would be a tuning that would be unorthodox to regular banjo. And the other one, uh, they were looking for a little bit more uh, Robert Johnson, Greece, Mississippi vibe, but they didn't want a guitar. They wanted something that had a unique tone. And so that's why. I something that had a little more grease to it and then it incorporates the uh the hybrid picking on the right hand uh, and so yeah so both of those different films are indie films but the uh, directors of those films have been well awarded in the past and i'm excited about it because they're not big budgets but they've got the potential of doing something great and it's just great to be part of it cool yeah, what you said about you know using it for a Robert Johnson sort of thing, I've always found that the band six string banjo has sort of this some you know middle ground sound between a resophonic guitar and and an acoustic yeah. guitar. So it has all that metallic sort of sound in there. Yeah, and it's almost a little industrial raw is what I call it. It's mm -hmm. uh you know it, it's almost uh you know the steel mills years ago. And, and Oklahoma ran to California to work the cotton fields. And it reminds me of that period in time uh, that Haggard talked about and some of his songs about how they would run to those cities to work. And a lot of those uh, people would bring their instruments. They would bring their guitars and their banjos and, uh, and, and it would really infiltrate a lot of things in that particular metropolitan area that would be in, influential for years to come. And uh, I think this, this instrument's definitely got the resonator sound, but the head just makes it more pleasing to me, you know? Uh -huh. so, I mean, we could do a little Fogarty with this thing. You know, it's just a great instrument, man. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm actually working hard to become a little bit more of an expert on it, even though I play it a lot. But when you get into film scoring, any instrument that you use, as Tommy Tedesco would have told us years ago, you need to be the expert on it. Uh -huh. You need to really know the instrument well so the director can say, play something, you know, and you go, I'll play exactly what you need. Here it right, is. Right, right. They can, they can describe a scene that, 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 that you know, an audience. It's, you know, yeah, it's important. Sonic scene. I think it's really important to, to kind of have your head wrapped around it. Uh, anyway. And how, how, how long have you been playing, Ranger? When did you first start getting into it? So this instrument? Just, just, the, just the six string in, in general? Uh, probably 13 years ago when yeah. I got my Boston. And um, my Boston allowed me an opportunity to, to continue with the Scruggs roll, forward mm -hmm. and backward roll. And then with the Bela Fleck, the alternating roll that Bela mm -hmm. made so popular. And it allowed me to do that at the same time and then play guitar. I mean, it was like, it was almost like giving me three aces or, you know, and then adding that fourth ace in there and going, no, really, it's, it's a banjo. It's a, uh, you can do everything you've been doing, you know, all your, all your positions, but it just gives you another ace in the hole. And, and uh, so, so about 13 years. And this one, I think I've had for maybe five. Uh -huh. It's become my favorite. Uh, I love convertibles. I just love <laughs> convertibles. Um, and so do all the, all the girls. So um, this one just seems to be one that I like a lot because from an audio standpoint, and I'm a graduate at Berkeley and uh, I teach at Texas A&M Audio one day a week, aside from doing the studio, I mic it from the front and I also mic it from the back. Wow. So, uh, there's a mic that'll sit right here and this will be dynamic and it normally will be a 57 in the back and then uh, a, a, a large diaphragm condition okay. mic in the front. Uh, How far goes, away do you put it in the front? Well, on, the, on this particular instrument, directly here is sweet spot at 14 inches. Okay, I mean, right, at, right at the right at the the um, where the where the pot meets the neck. Right, right there, a, aiming out. For some reason, it's just and the other magical spot is to take like an RCA ribbon mic, like a 1950 or so. Uh -huh. That one would hang 
uh, it's too high to show you, but it would hang over here about another three feet. Kind of, and so, you kind of get, get captures what you're hearing when you right. And so, question. so I'll get a little bit of my hand hitting the top. This particular mic's a little darker here, and then obviously the the fifty seven gives you a little bit of that that uh, backwoods kind of sound. But mm -hmm. we've done a lot of experimentation here. But three mics on this makes it Godzilla. Uh, right. One mic is fantastic. Two mics is great, but three mics is like unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. Uh, and do you get into, you have to be careful of phase issues, right? When you're having. Right. And so if you got a, 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 a large diaphragm microphone here and a condensed and a ribbon mic here, we're okay. We, these ribbon mics and that could be close together. No problem. Mm -hmm. The dynamic mic won't have any trouble with the, uh, with phase at all. Now, if I had three condenser microphones that were phantom powered, I have a problem. Okay. Uh, but these two are essentially ribbon and dynamic behind. So there's no problem. Uh, with a pattern, but it's, it's a great sound. I mean, it's, uh, I did it, I did record this banjo for, um, uh, uh, for, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank here, man. It's, it's my age, um, uh, for, uh, the fifth, uh, geez, I'm drawing a blank here. We'll have to come back to it. We'll come back uh, to it. I'll pop Beethoven, in your head in a Beethoven's fifth. Oh, right. I recorded that on this banjo. Oh, wow. And I sent it to Janet, uh, Jamie and, and Janet, and it may have got lost in the shuffle, but uh, that recording was done on this with those three mics, and it's it's amazing. It's wow. not, not because I played it, it's because <laughs> I know how to record it, you know, and get a good sound. Uh, and, and sometimes you play with, with finger picks, like, you know, like you would on a five-string banjo. How do you, when you're recording, yeah. there's a problem for a lot of the time of the, of the pick noise, you know, with the metal picks. How do well, you deal with that? my picks... Uh, my picks are Hamilton, uh, and, and actually these are actually these are Dunlops. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular set here, the Hamilton in the other bag, but these are rounded. And my brother Greg Davis has been playing banjo for for years, and so these are rounded to a degree that I don't have a lot of noise. Uh, <laughs> you still got a little bit of noise, but 14 inches out. Yeah. We, lose, we lose 12K and we lose 8K that far out. So we, right. lose, we lose that harmonic um, frequency uh, to be more, a little bit more audible out further. So if we come in 12 inches, it's a problem. 10 inches is a problem. 14 inches, perfect. But these rooms that I'm in are tuned. They're well tuned. They're flat, completely flat response. And so it makes a difference. If you're at home and you back the mic off that far, you might hear you're the refrigerator. Start hearing yeah, right, you might hear right. the refrigerator running in the background, so sure. it's a little tougher. But uh, these banjos work so well with finger picks. I mean, yeah. I don't know yeah. how many six string guys you know. There may be a lot. You you guys are in the trenches. You may think there's a lot. You, you may know of a lot of six string guys that play with finger picks. I don't know. Is that a pretty prevalent or most of the most most are doing tradition? You know, uh, you know, flat pick or or a thumb pick. You know, one, and not necessarily finger picks, but some do. There are definitely. Well, you know, uh, what, using the stuff. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Using the standard scrugs and then the backward, uh, the backward roll works so great on this instrument. I mean, if I was doing John Henry, uh, mm -hmm. using a backward roll right there. If I went the, the straight scrugs roll. Telly work. A lot of that is chicken pick and telly work. Yeah, yeah. And and I remember talking to Ron Block. I, I play a lot with John Jorgensen's bluegrass band. And Ron came in to fill in for Herb Peterson. And Ron Block said, I don't play banjo. I play telecaster. <laughs> and we sat down for a minute and I thought, you know what? You're not kidding, man. You roll every now and then and you do a telly leg. <laughs> I go, that's great, man. So, you know, and I always felt like that I was offending the bluegrass guys by doing that. Right. But, but if you roll every now and then, 
And the best way to practice is some guys may be thinking, how do I get that down? The best way to do it is a muted left hand. You uh -huh. have to do it muted left hand, you know, for basics. So to get my chops up on this, I'm kind of taking a rabbit trail here. So there is a little bit of a transition on this. And I stop me, Dave, if I'm doing some no, shit. It's great. But if I'm doing a, a, a roll, three, two, one, 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 three. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a last roll that's going to get me out of that roll. So three, two, one, yeah. three, two, one, three, two, three, one, two, one. So one, two, three, transition. One, two, three. So it gives you that. sounds exactly like like earl's it just doesn't have the high five in it yeah yeah you know yeah, and it, i remember tim may you guys you may be familiar with tim may the flat picker he's a great great yeah. guitar player and we had a group yeah. called davis miller may and he was like what banjo are you using i go i'm using this one right here <laughs> and he said really I, I i think i hear that high note and i said you don't it's not on the banjo right I said you just think i am because i'm doing the the scruggs lick or the scruggs roll forward and backward and you know it's it's really cool to be able to use this and and grab grab a great banjo sound without having to i mean i'm still playing banjo the tuning is slightly different but it is so much like playing traditional banjo it's hard to say it's not because i'm doing all the rolls correctly you know mm -hmm. But if you, you cannot get better, well, let's say this, you'll get better a thousand times faster because I do clinics all the time on guitar yeah. and I haven't done all the clinics on this, but I would, I would love to because the same thing applies is to use a left-handed muted, you know, so you're, yeah. you're basically only concentrating on the motor. If the motor's not good, you know, you walk into a club, the drummer sucks. It's a terrible show. Yeah, it's an awful show. Bass player is good, guitar player is good, but the drummer's horrible. This is your drummer. This is the drummer. If the drummer's not good, we might as well go to Waffle House and get some coffee and just leave <laughs> because this has got to be solid. And the only way you can do it, the best way you can do it, and this is tried and true data from uh, independent studies that I've done on music, is 60 beats a minute. They're really slow. All right. Even though I can play really fast, really slow. Same thing with the double down up. When I'm doing the double down up, everything is super slow. You know, if I want to, I was drop D for a second, guys. Sure. So I was in D at that point. But if I'm playing out of open F, playing you know sultans of swing i'm gonna i'm gonna do a little bit of strumming and a little bit of picking at the same time and i'm gonna mix those together just like i would on the double down up when i practice i'm doing muted left hand and a lot of people think well what about my left hand your left hand will always catch up mm -hmm. always catch up my heroes marty stewart earl scruggs sam bush i got to play for a couple of years with him uh, had some amazing coaches that would say, don't worry about this left hand. It's going to always catch up. If your right hand is dialed in, now you've got something to hang the left hand on. Mm -hmm. If you don't have something solid here, you're just wasting your time. So anytime you're doing a... If you're using a chord and you're working on this right hand, it's a lot to take in. It's a ton. You know, it's a lot to think about both sides. So the best idea is to just take whatever you're trying to learn, slow it down and mute it. So be. Same pattern, but I'm doing it muted. So, so what was that pattern that you're doing exactly there? It's a. Uh, you get a shiver in the dark and it's raining in the park. But meantime. Okay. So it's just the starting of a Sultans of Swing. Yeah, yeah. 
and, and it's basically a little bit of a it's really it could be a banjo piece but are you picking I, are you with your right hand are you picking with your fingers too i'm picking with my fingers as a hybrid the picks make it a little too brash yeah so And this instrument is great because you can do the. You can, you can get a little bit of a, a little bit of a more character out of it. Yeah. And, uh, a little bit more character out of it. So it's really cool. But I've worked that up for my solo show, uh, Sultans of Swing, which is one of my favorite songs, man. And um, it's 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 really a hoot on this instrument. I think it's it's more special. But muting the left hand and 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 applying anything, you may have some lick that you're just having a problem with, and so you're gonna you know take the motions of that lick. And just run through it muted left hand. What happens is the left hand is really light, and I'm not. I'm not mashing, but I'm just barely laying on it. What happens if you do that and you're working on your muted left hand with your right hand doing a pattern is it creates a relaxed state. It creates relaxed here, which causes the right hand to be relaxed. And if I'm playing fast, if I'm playing really fast, I've got to be super relaxed. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm, I'm going to barely, barely hang on to this pick. Just right. barely hold it. So I've got to be super relaxed. I've just really got to be, and it sounds like I'm hitting it hard, but I'm not. I'm barely playing. Yeah. Just barely playing. So if you relax the left hand and mute and try your pattern on the right hand, you're, you're going to accelerate your learning. I've seen it happen in students uh, 100 to 200 times plus. They'll be like way ahead. It's crazy. They'll come in the next month and they'll go, this sucks. I'm just doing this. But they got the right hand down. And now we add the licks to the left hand. Now we're adding notes to the left hand and, and the right hand's dialed in. And it's amazing. I mean, the milestone is huge. I've seen it. That, too players. Yeah, that's great advice. I mean, we get, you know, well, the most common questions we have is how do I how do I learn to play fast? And you know, we always tell people first, you know, learn to play slow and get it clean. And yeah, so when I'm working up. on when I'm working on any kind of a lick, like for Dire Straits, it's the the solo. stuff it's not anything really fast uh -huh. but the back half of that solo and then another double down up and then back into another spot so i'm gonna mix it back and forth and i'm doing all that dave to say playing fast is not very musical mm -hmm. it's just not and yeah. i know that my manager and Marty Stewart labeled me years ago, you're the shredder, man, you play fast. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that for more than a measure or maybe yeah, two. Yeah. Right. And they just don't, they just don't, unless they've had a lot to drink and then they're okay <laughs> with it. But you know, you want to use those, you want to like play them slow. <laughs> way more musical than this it's way more musical yeah. than that because it's got a little more character to it so as i've gotten uh this double down up thing technique where i do two downs and one ups it's great to have it and if i'm doing a um, maybe a clinic with brian sutton or david greer thank god they don't do what i do because those guys are amazing but I've got my own double down up technique, which allows me to play fast when I need it, but it's not very musical. So I have to use it sparingly, you know, and only use it in certain spots. 
So, so how does your double down up technique kind of differentiate from other cross picking techniques? Well, you know, if I'm going to play with a pick, the cross picking on this is like perfect. If I'm doing, um, get a shiver in the dark and it's raining in the park. And you can tell. Obviously, a straight standard. It's almost like a, a Jesse Meat Reynolds. Well, I'm doing a down, up, down, up, up, down. So, bad is blowing Dixie, double four time. And obviously, I'm doing that noise was our music store making a sell. <laughs> Congratulations. Sorry. I didn't realize it was turned on. I'm sorry. That's all right. I thought everything was muted. Uh, but what I'm doing is I'm doing a regular, you know, regular cross picking pattern. My double down up is two downs and one up. And George Shuffler, you may remember George Shuffler. Uh, I don't think he's with us anymore, but he yeah. did a, a, a floating down, up, up, down, up. nice pattern as opposed to down up down up down up down up which i'm i'm tracing my steps four three two three four four three two three four or i do the scrugs where i do four three two four three two four three two so there's a lot of you know variations and you're yeah. familiar with that but the double down up is two downs one up eddie van halen was doing this you know, as a kid, he was tapping, and I had no idea. So I thought he was was doing that. Uh -huh. So I had no licks, and this is the reason I stress the left hand muted. I didn't have any licks, and I remember Joe Carr and Alan Mundy as a kid going, "Don't do that. That's weird. That's really strange." <laughs> so well, I like the way it sounds. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So what it's allowed me to do is allow me to create an entire set of licks. <laughs> rotating that and when i practiced it with no licks i would do two two and one then i go to three and two you got the idea yeah and the next set of strings all the way up well it would allow me to rotate a pattern <laughs> Obviously, incorporate down up, down up stuff that I've learned for years on fiddle tunes and in standard licks, but it's really neat when you rotate it. So I'm in a I'm in a minor key. I'm in B minor here. And I'm gonna rotate that pattern. I'm just going to repeat the same pattern. So it's like a lot like grabbing a, a weed eater and going and starting a weed eater and just have it. So it's down, down, up, down, down, up. Anyway, so I rotate that. So when you go to different tunings, I'm going to go to open G. Notice how stable this thing is. You can get the G in like two seconds. Mm -hmm. So, new tune that I wrote the other day. I'll play it really slow for you. Yeah. I'm doing that the whole time. Down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down. So I got 
my monitor. My four. My five. Back to my one. So what I look for is I look for different ways to change the key and change the chord change and repeat several times. Sam Bush taught me years ago. I don't know if you're familiar with Sam. Oh, yeah. yeah. He repeats a lot of stuff. He's like uh -huh. beating the heck, heck out of it. I have no idea how he hits a note. No idea. And, and so he's able to repeat things. He said, Brad, we're playing a lot of crazy stuff. So there's no harm in repeating a lick four or five six times and i remember playing tell your ride and strawberry festival and all the hippies were out there going yeah yeah <laughs> after about the fourth fifth time they go yeah they get it you know <laughs> right right yeah. and uh, you know i'm sure they were doing some recreational drugs at the same time but <laughs> that particular thing of repeating is like this right here check out the changes on this going like this down down up down down up and all i'm doing is changing my stylist my right hand and I'm going to a pair of strings and a pair of strings and a pair of strings. And I'm switching back and forth, keeping the same technique. So I'm changing chord. Technique's really hard to learn. It's so easy. It's difficult to learn. And the problem with it is no one wants to mute this and spend time each day doing that. Right. So I've got a great business model. My wife says, you teach a clinic. They come in, they pay. They can't learn it. They come back again. <laughs> I said, it's not my, it's not my fault. <laughs> it's not my fault. I'm showing them exactly how to practice it, but, but it's amazing how fast it is. It's incredible. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. really very little effort because you're repeating the same technique all the time. So anyway, uh, this open G is really my head a little looser dave because mm -hmm. i got a little different tone going here sure. so if i use the pick and i try to get a, a, a pattern and on a pattern like that i'm normally doing a down up down and then an up up and then down, so. Sorry about It's a nice way to do it with your pick. Uh -huh. The uh, the banjo picks work really well with this open G tuning. I got hired years ago to do a book for Mel Bay, and it was on Robert Johnson. And I fell in love with this stuff, man. Uh -huh. So. Some of you guys that are doing this should realize that you don't always have to play a role. So check this out. I'm going to do what is called the toggle diamond, where I'm going a downbeat and then a double, a double two finger hit. Mm -hmm. Well, on the third, the second and third. And you can use those in any 
spots, you know, if you're using a, a, an F chord or a C chord or a G chord, it gives you a little bit of a chance to kind of add some flair and dynamics. And to me, as a player that's been able to make a living at this for a long, long, long time and had some great coaches, dynamics and flavor is, is exactly what the coffee's all about. I mean, if it doesn't have dynamics and flavor, why drink it? Right, right. I'm sorry, man. I've been rambling here. No, so. it's great. It's great. Great information. So, uh, so you're playing an open G tuning, and you played an open, you played in D, drop D before. Are there other, you know, the standard tuning? Are there other tunings that you kind of go? Well, let's to go like back to standard. Let's go to just good old standard. We haven't done that. Playing a lot of the film scores and sessions drop d and i call it drop g which is you know the a goes all the way down the g and the e goes all the way up to g oh. so it's a long stretch yeah and and everything else is the same nothing's changed from the four string down so i have not tried playing slide doing that but that would be pretty cool <laughs> i've not tried it uh because i love playing slide on telecaster and and, and uh, uh Les Paul, but on standard tuning, this good old standard tuning, we've got a lot of things we can do using a different bass note for the G. If we use our B note for the G, and I'm gonna think about sus, okay? I'm gonna go, a sus, a sus. The sus will get you out of a million holes. So if you're going. And it also gives you your four chord. It gives yeah. you a four chord right off the bat. One, four, five. It's a little bit of a dissonant. For the standard tuning, there's so much you can do with the sus and the and the two, the added two. And I, I don't think a lot of people realize that. They may just roll the G. They go, this is great, I'm doing it. So there's so much you could do by rocking that one note while right. you're doing your rolls. And yeah. I, I talked to a guy the other day and he said, man, my playing sounds so, so plain. I said, all you need to do is you need to sharp your, your fours. You need to, you need to basically go up to your, right. and you need to add those susses to them and, and the add two, you know, taking the one and going to the yep. two, two note. It just flavors things up so much better, and it and it allows your six string banjo stuff to sound a little bit more dynamic and colored, and you yeah, know, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it adds it adds a nice color tone without without bringing the harmony into kind of overly complex. Well, old, it makes you know, it it makes it a little bit more linear. Uh, and I, I look at Tom Petty a lot of times. Mike Campbell, I've had a chance to work with him a lot in the studio. Thanks to Marty Stewart. Um, and, and Mike would say, why put a fence on this side and this side of the cord? Why not let it be, you know, nonlinear to where it can kind of float mm -hmm. it can be minor. It could be major and it's going to sound way more interesting. If I go back to my open G and this, this instrument's great because of the strings day, because it'll, it'll be in that open G in like a second, you know, but you got, you got it. So you got uh, uh, um, uh, you got you got a lot of neat changes when you've got that low low G, you know. Mm -hmm. But you've also got our drone. 
So that's my high G, basically, right there. Right. Low right. G, right? So instead of having that high ringing, and I can say this because my brother's a banjo player, <laughs> the high ringing G used to irritate the heck out of me. And I used to give him a hard time. Banjo players always get the, the brunt of the jokes. You know, the banjo goes in the dumpster and it hits the accordion and it's a home run kind of thing. Uh, and, but having a low drone is awesome for a guitar player. It's just like perfect, you know? Yeah. Same thing with that D. If we go back to the... Uh, so I go to my low D, I've got a... my basically made my jeep my my five string mm -hmm. you know and that gives me that nice row sorry a lot of tune there my head's really loose for those out there listening my head is is dropped down about probably uh three sixteenths of standard level on the top here and I do that for a reason. We've been experimenting and letting the head relax a little bit gives it so much more life. And, and, mm -hmm. and everybody may have their heads tight, like super tight all the way around. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but using a microphone every day in the studio, I realize, oh, I, I don't know, that doesn't sound quite as good. So we'll loosen the head a little bit and let the, let the bridge sink into the head a little bit. And what, so what, what it does is when you're retuning, it makes it a little tough. Yeah, what pitch is the head tuned at? Because we do it to a to a note. This head is tuned to uh, C sharp, which no, is it must be F unusual. sharp. Yeah, which is really unusual. Yeah, yeah. And it it harmonically on a microphone. I don't know. I mean, if I tighten the head up, it would sound. It would just wouldn't sound as is as, uh, as fat. And it mm -hmm. wouldn't sound like maple syrup dripping off a hot biscuit. So if you guys are at, at the house and trying to figure out how to do the roll, if you've got a drop D, you've got your second and your, your, your third and your second string, and you've got your, you've got your sixth string, so you can do it. You can keep that low drone going not change it, let it roll. G. I'm going to let that low drone. It's nice just to let it drone and let it roll. Don't, don't worry about changing the top. Let it be a little bit non-linear, as Mike Campbell would say, and let that kind of roll over the top that changes. It just makes it so colorful. And if it, music's not colorful, and doesn't make me fall off the couch. I want to listen to it. You know. Uh, have you ever I'm tried sure. stringing the low E string to a high E string? I have actually, uh, and it works really well. It's really cool. I did a couple of recordings for this new sound, this new film score that I was telling you about, uh -huh. and this was a high E here, and it was cool. It was really cool. It reminded me a little bit of a Nashville tuning, you know, the high, high strung guitar. Uh, but I liked it a lot and, um, uh, don't tell any banjo players. I said that, but I, I, I like having the low is my preference, but they needed something on the top end for that particular soundtrack. They needed something that would ting, ting. Mm -hmm. And so we, we wound this with a, with an E string, same, uh, same 10 that was on here on the top. Uh, it's really funny that you mentioned that because that just happened just the other day. Wow. Uh, I wow. argued about it and they said, we really need something on the top that's going to go kind of like a bell tone. And I said, well, this has got to be a high end string, you know, and you I'm, didn't have about, the, I'm sorry. You didn't have an issue with the, with the, like the nut slot being cut too deep and it, and it. I did. I did. I had, I had to wrap it. So what I did is I took the string and I took a, um, um, it's a graphite uh, cloth that we've got yeah. here at the studio. It's really thin. And I cut a small strip the size of the nut and I laid it under the E string and dropped the E string 
inside of it. So it, it numbed the E string slightly, but it gave it that, that haunting bell tone. Yeah. Now as a guitar player, I love the low Dave. I mean, yeah. I, you know, um, I'm just, I love it. I mean, it's just something I really am called kind of to in my heart, but, but the director wanted something a little high and more ringy. So it's really funny that you mentioned that. Yeah. We just got to finish doing that last week. Um, it was a, I think I put an 11 on here so I could get it a little bit more stable tune wise. Uh -huh. So that's a 10 here. I think you were telling me, and I went to an 11 here just to get it a little bit more beef. Yeah. Yeah. But I had to wrap the slot right. to make it work. And when, uh, when you're playing live, how do you amplify your banjo? Uh, I normally use this amazing pickup. Uh, I'll tell you, this pickup pick is absolutely stupid. It's amazing. I've never heard a pickup on, on a banjo like it before. And I've been around banjo since I was a kid because my brother plays, Greg Davis. Um, but I, I, I recorded this into the API uh -huh. and the bomb factory and recorded it in Pro Tools and sent it to him. And he, I don't want to tell you what, it, what words he used, but he was pretty blown away of the fact that it was so fat and so monstrously tubby. It was great, which obviously allows you to add more high end if you want it, you know, if mm -hmm. you want that high end, but it will not feed back. I mean, I've used it in multiple loud situations with drums and bass and two guitars and it will, it, it just does not feed back. So that's, that's remarkable. I don't know, when did you guys come up with this? It's made by, it's made by John Cavanaugh. It's the Cavanjo pickup and uh, we started working with him probably about maybe about 10 years ago or so. Yeah. Well, it is, it is solid as a rock and I don't, I'm just trying to figure out, I guess you had some machine that could drill all the holes at once. That's, that's the, part of his, his patented process is to, is to drill the, get the holes in the head without destroying the head. And it probably it's hot. I'm sure it melted. it. It yeah, I'm not, so that it, I'm not it, sure if that's the, yeah. And then the screws go in, but it is, it's remarkable. I mean, I've, I've used it live pickup wise. I normally use it through a, like a, um, an AC 30 mm -hmm. or an AC 15. I love British gear, love British gear. Anything too, anything too. Yeah, Jamie, anything too <laughs> is my favorite, You're welcome. but it, it, it is definitely an amazing pickup, man. I mean, I, you, there's, it's it's way beyond anything else that's out there right so now. So you do prefer using using a tube amp on with the banjo than yeah. an acoustic amp or something? Absolutely. I mean, way better than a solid state. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, that's just me. I mean, a lot of guys may like using a small solid state amp, but uh, this particular pickup is is rock solid. I mean, you guys have outdone yourself on this. I mean, totally. do, do you run through effects or any? You, like, uh... I, I do not. I got I got embarrassed by <laughs> by Reggie Young, uh, one of the great Nashville guitar players. He was in. A, we were doing a session for the Olympics, and uh, he was playing sitar, and I was playing guitar. And I had a rack, and he had two pedals and a '65 Blackface Twin. Nice. And and he looked at me like, "Why are you using all this stuff?" You know. And I was a young kid. And I was like, I thought it sounded good. And he said, it does not sound good. Get rid of it. So that kind of taught me how to basically just use maybe a delay pedal, mm -hmm. two delay pedals, a tight one and a long one, and then maybe a tremolo in my, in my session pedal board, a tremolo, and uh, maybe an overdrive to have an overdrive, and a wah-wah pedal, and that's it. Nothing else. Zero. You know, no other effects with it. And the thing about it, the instrument sounds so good. I hate to run this through anything unless mm -hmm. it's a reverb or a delay because the pickup sounds so good by itself. Uh, you're really doing yourself harm by trying to flower it up because it's already set. It's already got a Rolls Royce emblem on the front of it. And it sounds amazing. And, and I've done a lot of testing daily in the studio, guys. So if you don't have a studio, you do not have a microscope. I have a microscope. That's a good way to look at it. <laughs> and and this thing is under a microscope daily and, and it's uh sometimes we use it in sessions plugged in it depends on if they want something really cool we have a double leslie i have uh, john jorgensen's backline for elton john on loan and hopefully i get to keep it for a long time john if you hear this 
Do not come get your gear. So I have a double Leslie that he used live with Elton John uh, and several other amps. But this banjo ran through a double Leslie wow. is, like, is like heroin. It's incredible. <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely incredible. You'll never hear anything like it. So uh, I really thank you guys for making such an awesome instrument. It's a big, bold statement right there. Too, <laughs> for anyone who knows what that does feel like. If, if, if you know. guys ever play through a double Leslie, you'll never, ever be the same. I guarantee you. I, I feel like there's a, there's a, de a dedicated session coming on about oh, yeah. banjos <laughs> right. and double Leslies. Right. Let's, have, let's have some fun. Yeah, there was a few people commenting on, on, the, on the pickup that they, they, they noticed on the, on the banjos. So I'm glad you brought that up. A um, couple of other people in the chat asking about um, blues. Can you can you play some blues notes and blues? Yeah. And see how that some bends going. get there you know as, as dave and i were talking about geez a whole another ball of wax um and we should quickly try it because i've never done it before this will be a first time i was just going to ask about slides we, we've got about nine minutes before we get thrown out of this makes it sound a little bit like it's a Mississippi riverbank kind of a vibe. Keeping that rolling. If I go to D, hmm. since we're running out of time, let me try that. What's neat about this, I got to say real quick, it's really easy to get this to D and G quickly. Yeah, you're, you're demonstrating the tuning really well. I have no tuner in front of me, so there, it's it's really remarkable. Asking on the on the NAM side of things, um, just kind of basic strumming. Like you, we're playing a lot of licks right now, but like if you want to get something a bit a bit more straightforward, how exactly. does it perform for for, for, for you know a, a basic strumming pattern? Yeah, you. so let's say we're doing find out when I do this, uh, Jamie, I've got to think a little differently about what I'm doing. If I'm doing, I'm really muting a lot more than I normally. And you were with a with guitar. Yeah. yeah, so I'm muting a lot more.
so I'm doing a lot more muting on this. And, and I think when I grab this banjo, when I grab a banjo, mm -hmm. uh, then this is probably my main instrument on banjo, the, the Boston I love. But with the pickup on this, it's so much more versatile. And I know I could put a, I could put a head on that one, right? Yeah, yeah you could do that. And I could yeah. turn that into a Maserati in a couple seconds by putting a head <laughs> on it. But but on this one, I tend to, to mute a lot more when I'm doing chords. And if I'm doing that, you get a shiver in the dark and it's raining in the dark. So I'm doing a lot of muting on the left hand. That is going to be the fourth time. You feel all right when you hear the music green. Then you step inside and you do TD to me. So. That's, yeah. So I do a lot more muting on this particular right. instrument because I don't want it to ring quite as much. Yeah. And and it's it's I think everybody's different. They look for a different tone. If I grab this instrument and I grab a guitar and I play my technique, my I'm gonna play this instrument totally different than I would my guitar because I'm yeah. looking for a tone and it's gonna cause my right hand to go from like what I call zero to ten and 10 is being the tightest to the loosest, it's gonna cause me to find that spot quickly. You know, my ear is gonna cause me to go, no, nah, no, nah, nah, there, there it is, right there. So and, yeah, that raises an interesting point as well, because I, I hear a lot of people talk about the six string banjo in the context of they play guitar and they, they have a six string and it takes them in a different direction creatively. Like right. because of the different tone, like it just if they're struggling on a piece or a, or a direction of a song, for example, a lot of people say this. They'll they'll try playing it on the banjo, and it just takes them to a different spot. Um, do you find the same thing? I do. It may because between here and here is a tension yeah. knob, basically, and and I go back to the bridge when I'm playing faster because I need more tension, and I can play a way way lighter and way more relaxed. Tim May, another guitar player that goes way forward when he's playing, uh, when he's playing fast, totally weird for me. Everybody's different. Everybody's yeah. got a, you know their own technique. But this is basically a soft and a hard volume knob between here and here. So if I'm doing a, hang right here for something like that but but obviously when i get this instrument i'm gonna it's gonna cause me to go a little different based on tone and new players don't really have that that home base of tone they don't have that home signature uh yeah. i've developed a home signature on the guitar so when i grab this instrument it really makes me change where that's at yeah. and it and it, it it's such a personal human thing that it's really tough to measure yeah. You know, it's so hard to measure. It's a, you only know where you're at to go. David Greer gave me um, uh, a Sears and Roebuck plywood guitar one time. He was playing it just to piss off every one of the bluegrassers for fun because his uh, old Martin was being fixed. And they were like, that sucks. Look at the, look at the, the, the stain is coming off on your hand, man. Why are you playing yeah. that thing? Yeah. And when David played it, it sounded great because his right hand went to a spot that was the spot it found that particular spot between here and here that made it sound amazing yeah. and so i you know it's hard to say you got to have a good instrument and if you don't why are you playing it uh, <laughs> but if you're playing something that's not like the banjo is totally different than the guitar right it's a little bit more mid-rangey 500 800k it's got a little bit more of a point to it than the yeah. guitar does and guitar is a little bit more 250 and a little bit more 8 and 12 and way up high and so this instrument is an amazing instrument so you can't say it's not great like a guitar but it does it does a does force you to kind of find that sweet spot in between here and here Absolutely. and everybody's going to have to 
going to have to work with that. I mean, they're really going to have to work with that and find that spot that's going to make them feel like, wow, that's amazing. So the one at serious uh, bit of information that's really important is everybody that's listening. And we may have some great players here that are like awesome players and gunslingers and whatever. Uh, and I've dealt with a lot of those guys in clinics for over the years. But if you can play a downstroke, Everybody in here can play one downstroke that'll sound as good as your hero. Everybody can. There's no question about it. We can all go, you know, something like that. That's as simple as that lick. Everybody can do it. And if everybody can do it, then everybody can take their downstroke lick, their simple downstroke lick, and find that sweet spot for their ear. Because everybody's different. You know, Jamie's going to sound different than Dave. I'm going to sound different than all than both of you guys. I'm going to try to find that spot that is Brad Davis, basically. Right. And, and whatever that amounts to, I'm going to try to find that spot that just really fits me. But everybody can play one or two or three down licks straight down, just like they're a hero. Everybody can. Can and agree no with you more. Any excuse. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great advice. Great advice. And it's, it's a great uh, wrap up point because we are at the hour. Uh, we have to start, start slowing it all down. But the cool thing as well, um, there's you know a few people asking um, things like strings. The, the six string banjo, just so everyone knows, uh, it, it, it's not. We you know, Deering didn't invent this instrument. It's been around for a long time. Um, Johnny Sincere used to play right. uh, six string banjo. Had a, you know right. deep roots in, in the jazz world, um, and it's just, it's been around for a long time. So it's not uh, something that requires a lot of special equipment. That you know the strings are guitar strings on the Deering models at least. Uh, you can get the ball end strings, you can wrap them up with your favorite gauge, you can experiment that way. Right. Um, and, it, and it's incredibly versatile. You demonstrated the tuning beautifully, different styles of playing beautifully. Um, and it's it's not designed to replace a guitar. It's not designed to replace no. a five string banjo. Like you say, it is just a different paintbrush in your in your, in your your box, right? Different tool that you have to, uh, to go in different directions. I mean, you could, you know, as you were talking about strumming, I mean, you could, I mean, you could do that old jazz vibe right. that was very popular in Chicago and, uh, and it's very Django esque. It's yeah. very muted, you know. You know, so there's a lot of application for that, but everything is tight. It's not, it's not sustained. Um, and uh, I prefer that on guitar because I'm a guitar player. Uh, I love banjo to roll and I'm playing yeah. a banjo. This is really a banjo. Don't, don't get confused. It's a banjo. It's going to sound like a banjo when I'm playing it. So Absolutely. unless I'm playing Sultans of Swing. <laughs> <It may sound like. laughs> well, I'm going to ask you to play us out in just a second. So for anyone yeah. uh, interested, DeeringBanjos.com, go check it out. Um, you're holding the Good Time 6 model. There is a... Uh, Good Time 6R, which is a similar model, but with a resonator back. We also have a couple of upper line models, the, the Boston, which you have, uh, Brad, as well, which is a steel rimmed uh, upper line, and the Phoenix, which is right. a wonderful I saw model. that in the ad today. <laughs> yeah, I was, in the, I was in the ad today. That's right, on the, on the email. <laughs> the Phoenix, yeah, I saw that. I didn't know about the Phoenix, but it's really cool looking. Sorry, yes, go ahead. The, double, double pickup, Cavanjo at the neck and a, and a piezo under the bridge with a... With a um, uh, a, a switch knob and a, and a volume control as well. So yeah, it's a really cool oh. instrument. So uh, different options and um, yeah, Brad, thank you so much for joining us, man. Today that was that was hey, a lot of fun. Jamie, was thanks great. so much for letting me be part of the family. Um, oh, of course, this this instrument is helping me pay bills. <laughs> okay. then, then, then we've done our job, right? That's what. <laughs> <laughs> we, we want we want to give you know we want to make tools for for people like yourself to be able to play and use uh, that you can rely on and that's kind of the point so if we've done that then then we're doing what we're supposed to be doing so thank you for for representing thanks for having me guys it's been a real treat right. you want to play us out a little there yeah all right Brad. thank you man Step inside and you don't
guys for having me today. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much, Brad. That was great.